Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. So last time I was here, I spoke about, um, the, well, my topic was back then was uh, we relax and take it easy. We don't struggle, you know, and what I've come to realize when I'm awake is that when I'm struggling uh, with you, with situations or the circumstances of my life, uh, it's probably because I'm doing one or two or three things like trying to get my way, uh, trying to control you or trying to manipulate the situation. Uh, and it's really important that I see that. Right. It's really important that I'm awake to that. Uh, you know, and the reason why is because if I'm not awake to that, that I'm trying to control or run the show or trying to manipulate or trying to get my way, uh, what I do is, or what my ego likes to do is it likes to start, it likes to start building walls between me and you and me and God. And, you know, one of the first things I heard when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, um, you know, I would hear the old timers throwing out the slogans. I would hear the old timers saying things, these pearls of wisdom and, I'll never forget this one guy. He said that alcoholism is a soul sickness caused by a separation from God and a disconnect from each other. And when I really think about that, you know, uh, man, that, 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 that's my alcoholism to a T. There's a separation from God. I think I'm God. And more importantly, there's a wall between me and every person that's around me because I just can't let you know about me and I just can't be vulnerable to you and let you know what's going on in my life. When I sit with a sponsor and I come out, you know, reading those early chapters, I come out of chapter five, I'm reading how it works. You know, uh, I come out of the ABCs and it says on page 60, being convinced we're at step three, um, which is that we decided to turn our will and our life over to the, uh, over to God as we understood him. Just to, what do we mean by that? And just what do we do? The first requirement, not the first suggestion, but the first requirement is that I be convinced that my life run on self-will can hardly be a success. On that basis of running my life on my will, I'm always in collision with something or somebody, even though my motives are good. And there are times because of my motives that I can't see that I'm trying to run the show. You know, when they talk about that selfishness and self-centeredness is the root of the troubles, you know, we hear it all the time. Where are the roots on a tree? It's under the surface. I don't even see what I'm doing, that kind of stuff. So that's why I picked the topic I did for tonight. You know, I think it's just uh, when, I'm, when, I'm at, when I'm struggling uh, or, or, you know, rebuilding these walls between me and you, I wanted this line to pick, I wanted to pick this line tonight that we constantly remind ourselves that we're no longer running the show. You know, there was a time early on in my sobriety when I thought that these steps were like, like in a compartment, you know, like linear, you know, uh, step one, done, step two, done, step three, done, step nine, done, 12, done. At the end, you know, your sponsor would give you a blue ribbon or a plaque to put on your wall that says accomplished or done. And you just move on. What you move on to, I have no idea. But what I've experienced through the years is that these steps are so intertwined and so, so, I don't know, the words I want to use is like, it's like a rhythm. It's like a flow, you know, a way of life, a design for living, that every time I'm looking at certain steps, I'm pulling in all the steps. It's just, there's this, just this connection with all the steps. And, you know, when I got to step 11, you know, or when I first read step 11, let's say, off the shade of a, a you know, off the shade in a, in a meeting, I thought that, you know what, we pray, we meditate, and that's about it, you know. Little do I realize that, you know, that I've been praying, that I've been taking actions, that I've been acknowledging new ideas, that I've been, you know, challenging some old ideas uh, from the moment I cracked the book open, you know. Um my old sponsor used to say this all well, he says it all the time. I've heard it from some of you guys, you know, that my alcoholism doesn't come in a bottle, but it comes in my mind. And many of us, like me or myself, I should speak of, you know, I come into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous with this dualistic thinking. It's always black and white. I like to talk about the pendulum. You know, one day I like it, the next day I hate it. One day I love my job, the next day I'm quit my job. It's that pendulum of emotions that goes back and forth. And some of us get better with that over time and working the steps and having a sponsor being accountable. But some of us stay stuck with that. And that's with double digit sobriety of that dualistic thinking. And I think the reason why we're like that is, you know, uh, 
the human mind likes to do two things really well. Number one, it endlessly keeps me in the past. The wouldas, the couldas, the shouldas. And the other thing it says, I'm always worried about the future. So my mind, the great enemy, is the problem. And both sides of that coin, whether it's the past or whether it's the future, are always being driven by my hurts, my unresolved conflicts, uh, my old ideas, uh, and especially my character defects. You know, And I'm a guy with a lot of character defects. I'm a guy with a lot of old ideas about a lot of things. You know, uh, I come into Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, even before Alcoholics Anonymous, I grow up. I'm a kid that has a lot of fear. I have a lot of insecurity. And more importantly, I'm a kid with a lot of secrets. Now, that doesn't make me alcoholic, but let me tell you something. You know, I'm growing up with this guy called Dad. He's cunning. He's baffling. He's powerful. I grow up with this guy who is really just an angry guy. My dad comes from that generation. There's no hugs. There's no I love yous. If there's a problem, he either drinks at it or gets angry at it. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of fear in my house. But every night, my dad would walk in that house, and what would happen was, my mom would make these two pictures, one called Martinis, the other one called Manhattans, and my dad would take that first drink. And all of a sudden, I'd see the magic happen. And all of a sudden, that guy became a different guy. All of a sudden, he became the fun guy. He became the guy that didn't want to have a catch in the backyard. He just became a different person, the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. But then there were those days. And those days looked like this. My dad would come in and take a drink, and all of a sudden, the plates and the rage and the tornado and everything would explode in the house. And chairs would be flying, plates would be flying, one of us kids would be flying and he grabbed one of us, you know, and there was a lot of fear with my dad. There was a lot of fear I had growing up with my dad. And there was a lot of insecurity. And not that I needed hugs and told, uh, being told that I love you so much, but you know what? I had this thing called self-esteem and I got this thing called pride and they're fighting each other. What I think about myself and what you guys are thinking about me, I'm always in that competition of that mind, always thinking about what's going on. And then there's secrets, you know, there's secrets. I grow up in this house. I grow up in a neighborhood where the only requirement for membership is five or more kids. There's always a party. There's always an event. There's always alcohol. And what I would witness is my dad and my uncles and all the elders in the neighborhood just getting loaded all the time. And I'd see stuff and I'd see stuff in my house. And, you know, I grow up in that type of house where, you know what, whatever goes on in this house doesn't leave this house. So there's always a bunch of secrets going on inside me. Now, I'm six, seven, eight years old. I'm 10 years old, you know, and I'm already got these character defects that I don't even know what character defects. Eventually, eventually, you know, it's kissing cousins come running along of shame, guilt, and remorse, and all the other stuff that's attached to that kind of stuff. But what happens to a kid like me is I take my first drink, uh, first drink 51 years ago. I can remember it ha- like it happened, you know, like it happened this afternoon. And 51 years ago, I'm in a cemetery with five guys. And, uh, you know, and here comes that first bottle of Colt 45 malt liquor. And I start drinking on that Colt 45. Here comes the next bottle of blackberry brandy. And, and I'm getting drunk and I'm getting blacked out and I'm getting sick. And I go home and I take a beating and I take, you know, I get grounded for life and all that stuff, you know. And the hope was in. I couldn't wait to do it again. And what happened to a guy like me is I stepped on the path that goes straight to hell. And over the next 16 years of my life, I got to that place where we all get to that place of pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization. Homeless and alcoholic living on the streets of Northern New Jersey. I can't stop because of the exception. And I can't stop once I start because of this allergy. You know, I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place. And I'm trying everything to be normal. And I don't even know what normal looks like. But I believe normal has something to do with external circumstances and external conditions. You know, so I think money, property, prestige, I think having a nice car or a nice girlfriend, I think if I have nice clothes on, that's the stuff that's going to work for me. But none of that stuff works. I like when the Richard Rohr, I've heard him speak many times when he talks about, you know, he talks about we feed the beast, that we feed the mind. And what we feed the beast with is our anger, our judgment and our fear. And that pendulum of black and white, that pendulum of past and future. You know, what I found out about me is that I can never be present as long as I'm being driven by the beast and being driven by my mind. So here I am, 19 months, living on the streets, broken, beyond broken, sick, beyond sick, 29 years old, walking the streets of New Jersey, walking the streets of lower Manhattan, panhandling, stealing, losing my, my my identity completely. 
uh, emotionally broken down, physically broken down, spiritually broken down. Uh, I'm just a, f- a shell of a person. And it's amazing when I even say that to myself or even hear myself say that the person I was back then compared to the person I am today. It's just amazing what Alcoholics Anonymous has done for me. But here I am. I walk into a bar one night. And I'm looking to steal. I'm looking to panhandle. And uh, some old guy comes up to me and says, hey, Jimmy, they're hiring guys like you in Newark Airport. Guys like me. I was like the joke around, finally being seen for my potential. But guys like me. And what happened that next day is I went out to Newark Airport, completely broken. Went out with two other guys. We stole a car. We went out there. And it was an airline called People's Express that eventually became Continental, eventually became United. And back then, People's Express used to hire guys like us. And the job was to hopefully get the luggage that's over there and get it on the plane that's over there. And I always kid around. I always like to segue here and say, if you were flying through Newark Airport in the 80s and you're still waiting for your luggage, I could make amends after this meeting. But that was the job. And I remember waiting to be called, and I sat down in this metal chair, like we sit in many metal chairs in church basements all over the country. And I was so broken. I'm 29 years old, and I don't even know how to put the words to what I felt like. It wasn't until I came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous that I was really able to see what I was up against. And it wasn't until I eventually read Bill's story. And on page eight, Bill gives his first step of description, which I think is really the first step of description for all of us at our bottom. When he talks about no words could tell the loneliness and despair I felt in a bit of morass and self-pity. Quick hand stretched around me in all directions. I met my match. I've been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master. And for the first time in my life, I thought maybe just maybe alcohol is a problem. I'm 29 years old. A blind man can see that alcohol is a problem. But I am in such delusion, I am in such denial of my situation that I can't see the truth about it because I'm that guy. I'm just that guy that blames everything out there for the way I feel deep down in here. But again, I'm also that guy that's always seeking something out there to make myself feel better. And yeah, I'm living a double-edged sword life. And I'm broken and I'm sick and I'm dying of this thing called alcoholism. But what happens to me is I sit in a metal chair in this airport. Now, you can just imagine how many people are walking through an airport when a complete stranger sits next to me. And after a couple of minutes, a stranger looked at me and said, what's your problem? And for whatever reason, but I know the reason today, it's God's grace. I spit my life story up on this guy in about 10 minutes. And he looks at me and says, I have the solution for you. And I said, what's that? He goes, is it possible for you not to take a drink today? I I said, I'm not sure. I want to drink right now. It's about 10 o'clock in the morning. He goes, where do you live? And I said, well, I'm not living anywhere, wherever I can put my head down. And this is pre-cell phone, pre beeper days. He pulls out a piece of paper and he writes down the street and goes, do you know where this street is? I said, yeah, that's in my old neighborhood. Try not to drink and be in front of this address at 7 o'clock tonight. And again, but for the grace of God, at 7 o'clock that night, stone cold sober, standing in front of 153 Linden Avenue in this city, totally delusional that I even meet somebody today? Is this a dream or a nightmare? My belly was knotted with fear, insecurity, or, or, you know, all that anxiety. When all of a sudden, a 1979 Chevy Impala pulls up. And the stranger I met in the airport was driving the car. And he had a couple of other strangers in the car. And when they pulled up, they rolled down the window and they said, the most spiritual thing you'll ever hear in Alcoholics Anonymous, get in the car. And I got in the car with these guys. And they took me probably less than 500 yards around the corner to my grammar school. And they walked me into my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that was on March 28, 1987. Our good friend Ralph likes to say this all the time. I stole this line from him because I like it. Walking into grace doesn't feel like walking into grace. Feels like I was walking out of chaos. But for the first five years of my life, you know, being an alcoholic to nine was, you know, I fell for that delusion that a lot of us fall for, that abstinence is a solution to a spiritual malady. And that if I just don't drink and put the plug in a jug, everything's going to be all right. And in my case, a lot of things got all right real quick. I got back with the wife I walked out on. I got back, I got a real job, a really good job. I eventually got a house. I eventually had my first uh, brand new car. I eventually had two little AA babies. I eventually had money in my pocket, money in a bank. And to the untrained eye, it looks like normal living is a solution to alcoholism. But in five years without a drink, I'm dying from something I don't even know I'm dying from or even understand that I'm dying from. It's called untreated alcoholism. 
And what happened to me was I was asked to speak on the second step, talk about God and talk about how I came to believe that a power greater than myself can restore me to sanity. And see, I'm paralyzed by what people think. See, I'm paralyzed with fear of what you think of me. See, all those things as a six-year-old, an eight-year-old, a 10-year-old, they haven't gone away. They're just down deep down in my soul. I still got all that insecurity. I still got all that unresolved stuff. I still got all that hurt and conflict and pain that many of us walk around with. But I don't talk about that stuff because now I'm five years sober. And pride and ego has stepped into my place. And ego and pride says, there's no reason to talk about this stuff. You can handle this stuff. But at five years without a drink, I'm at this podium and I'm lying to all of you. And I know the 12 and 12, and I could tell some jokes at times, you know. And at the end of the meeting, a man walked up to me. And he said to me, well, he said something that was a lot salty than what I'm going to tell you. But he basically said to me, you're screwed. And I wanted to start a fight in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous because I don't know how to face resistance with no resistance. I don't know how to face conflict without violence. I'm just not drinking. I haven't changed, changed one iota from when I walked in or when I was on the streets. But what happened was I looked at this guy in his eyes. And again, another moment of another moment where God was doing for me what I could never do for myself. And I looked at this guy, Bill Grace was his name. He came from St. Paul, Minnesota, the same place my sponsor is from today. And I looked at this guy in his eyes. I'm six foot four. He was six foot four. And I looked at him. I said, you're right. I need help. And that next day, I find myself in a railroad room apartment, and I'm getting a spiritual test. Probably the spiritual test that some of you guys have been given by someone who's on with the facts about himself and carrying a message of depth and weight. And as I sat in this guy's apartment, he was peppering me with a few questions. First question was, how long could you hold your breath? How long can you be in a 12-step program and not work the 12 steps? What does your relationship with God look like? Well, I'm Catholic. I believe in God. But what does God have to do with any of this? He asked me another question. He goes, what makes you alcoholic? And the best I could stammer out of my mouth at that moment was I drink too much. I had no idea about this physical allergy. I had no idea about this mental obsession. He asked me a question that many of you might not, might not believe, but this is the way it was in my neighborhood in the 80s and 90s. He looked at me and said, where's your big book? And I said to him, what's a big book? Now, I'm sure there was a big book at a literature table or at the podium or it was, you know, guys were reading it. But I was never encouraged to open that book. And I always say it wasn't until Joe and Charlie came through the, through the Northeast in the, in the early 90s that, you know, we all got crazy and started to use the book like a weapon. You know, you better do it this way now that we all know, right? And then he asked me a simple, well, it wasn't even a question. It was a consideration. He just looked at me and said, Jim, if AA works, why do you have so many problems? He goes, I'm not working AA. I'm self will run riot. I'm making all the decisions. I'm trying to control. I'm trying to manipulate. I'm trying to get my way. It's really hard to be honest and thorough when you have to be right all the time. So he started to paint this picture for me. He told me there's two goals in Alcoholics Anonymous, two goals I believe today. I mean, you know, it's up to the, uh, you can interpret this any way you want, but I think the first goal was the obvious one. Don't pick up the first drink. But the second goal is the goal we all want to attain. And that's to step into the sunlight of the spirit. Because when we step into the sunlight of the spirit, we find that place of freedom where the bondage of self gets removed where we have a relationship with God and we have a relationship with each other, where all the promises in the literature come true. It's a place of freedom. But in order to get out into the sunlight of the spirit, I have to walk through the darkness of my life. And I got to start uncovering, discovering, discarding the things that are blocking me from you, blocking me from God. I got to bring the walls down. My sponsor likes to talk about all the time. You know, we live life like we're driving. We, 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 we live life like we're live, we live in a tank. And all of us are just looking through that little hole, just blown away things. And our perspective and our, perce and our perception of life is flawed. And we can't see it. So I was willing to go in. I was willing to go in. Many of you have heard me read this a million and one times because I think it's, for me, it's one of the most powerful little readings that we have in our literature. And it comes out of a book called Daily Reflections. It says, it's the side of myself that I refuse to look at that rules me. I must, be willing to, uh, I must be willing to look at the dark side in order to heal my mind and heal my heart, because that's the road to freedom. I must walk into darkness to find the light 
and walk into fear to find peace. You know, the way the old times used to say that is like Alcoholics Anonymous, like a big bonfire. And most people in AA are just walking around that fire, but eventually that fire is going to die and go out. But if you really want to change, if you really want to have an experience, if you really want to step into the sunlight of the spirit, you need to walk through that fire and feel the uncomfortable and get your ass burnt and feel the uncomfortability of change. And see, here I am, five years without a drink in my life, dying of this thing called alcoholism, and I was willing to go to any length, whatever he told me to do. So we opened up that book, and we started to read those early chapters. And he started to share his experience with me. And I started to see things for the first time in my life that I didn't even know was going on. So many unresolved answers that I was always looking for. How I feel? Why do I feel? Why is this going on inside of me? Why do I always have to try to run the show and be the director of everything? What kind of insecurity in me makes me do that kind of stuff? What kind of fear generates me to want to be the director of life? What is it in me? So step, to, step one tells me about my powerlessness. Step one was the first time I started to understand that I'm powerless because of these two, these two things called the allergy and the obsession. This phenomenal called craving. It answered a lot of questions. Why can't I stay stopped? Why can't I stop? Why can't I stop once I start to drink? I had no idea that I had no power, choice, and control in my body once I started to drink, that all bets were off. I drink until I pass out, get locked up, or whatever the case may be. I had no idea that I had no power, choice, and control in my mind. I thought I'd just change my mind. I had no idea that my mind, this idea that's so strong, it overcomes all other ideas. I had no idea about that until I sat with another man. And I'm five years in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, making coffee, setting up chairs, doing everything we do in a home group. And this is the first time I'm hearing this stuff. Step two, I'm Catholic. I have no problem with God. That's what I thought. That's how I looked at step two. I had no idea about insanity. I had no idea about the mind. I had no idea about these old ideas that drive me. Truth of the matter is, AA is not about getting us to quit, quit drinking anyway. It's just quite the opposite. More about alcohol this tells me that I have no mental defense against the first drink, that I lack the power. I don't have the power to stop drinking. And that AA is designed to really wake us up to that great reality and to have a spiritual experience. And if we agnostics doesn't do that job for us, guess what? We're all dead men walking. I remember I did a, I did a, uh, a conference a couple of years ago in Pennsylvania. I live right by Silkworth's grave. So I guess they thought I'd be qualified to talk about Silkworth since I live by his grave. I don't, I don't know what they were thinking, but that's what happened. So I called my buddy up, who's an archivist in, uh, in New Jersey, and I said to him, you know, John, uh, can you send me some stuff? Like, I know there's history books about so forth and all this stuff. So he sends me 27 medical talks that Silkworth did to universities and medical societies. And I'm reading all of them, and they all sound the same, basically the same story in, in all these medical journals. But what caught my eye in all of them was this phrase that Silkworth said. He said, for the alcoholic, sober, in Alcoholics Anonymous, who doesn't fully accept the second step, that alcoholic still has a reservation and a lurking notion, and that alcoholic will drink again. And that made the hair on my back of my neck stand up. No human power is going to relieve us of this, of, us of this deal. And when I read that, I was really, really convinced that I need to seek this power with the desperation of a drowning man. You know, when I was put on my knees by this sponsor, and I held his hands, and I did that third step prayer. But the prayer is just an affirmation of really the, what the decision is. Because when I read that, step three was really the first time in my life. And it sounds kind of cheesy now. Like, it's like clear as day. But I couldn't see it back then, how driven I was by old ideas and negative thoughts. And how I feel superior to everyone. And I think I'm better than everyone. And I play God, and I'm the director of everything. I didn't see that. But what started to happen was I started to see something I never saw before, that my selfishness and self-centeredness is the root of my trouble. And the reason why I couldn't see it again, under the surface stuff, I've been practicing certain behaviors for so long, I didn't even know that I was practicing these kind of behaviors, that all my troubles are of my own making. I swore it was you. I swore it was her. 
I swore I was the boss. So when I got on my knees with that man, I made a decision. And the decision is really a simple concept that it talks about. But I got to get out of the director's chair. And I got to give the director's chair back to God. Right? God's my employee. I work for employer. I work for God. Talks about the principal and the agent. We hear this all the time. You know, sports stars are the principals, actors. They all have agents. What do the agents do? They get their endorsements. They work for the principal. So if God's my boss and I work for God, well, what does God want me to do? Pretty simple. Help his kids. Help his kids. We have three purposes in Alcoholics Anonymous. We always hear that. Primary purpose, singleness of purpose, and real purpose is to fit myself to be a maximum service to God and to others. Am I really doing that? And then it says that God's the father where the child. You know, and I got a little hung up on that one, but what it really comes down to is that like most good fathers, they take care of their children. So this decision that I made is that God's going to be the boss. I'm going to work for God. I'm going to help his kids. And if I do that simple task, God will take care of me. That's step three. And then the prayer is just an affirmation. And what I see for the first time in my life at five years uh, without a drink in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous is my first spiritual truth. And that spiritual truth is in order to get out of the darkness, I need to serve others. I never knew that because I've always been serving myself. Right? But I needed to go into the darkness and I needed to face that beast. You know, can't heal something you don't see. So I had to go into that hallway of darkness. And that's the way I describe it to the guys that I sponsor here. We sit at my kitchen table downstairs and do everything I just talked about. There's a glass door at the end of my hallway. Beautiful day today in New Jersey, sunny. That's the goal. Step out through that keystone, right through that archway, and you'll be a free man. But in order to step out through that archway or through that door, that door, that, the door you got to walk through this hallway of darkness. And you got to uncover, discover, and discard the things that are blocking you from God. And more importantly, I think you have to do something that, for me, I thought was a weakness, but was really strength in disguise. I needed to be vulnerable to another man. I needed to talk to another man about what's going on in my life and share my life with this other man. You know, one of the first things that was very apparent to me going into the darkness was the first time was there's always been my way. And it's always been your way. And unfortunately, my way seems to always be right. And your way always seems to be wrong. And I couldn't see the truth about that until I started to look at some of the common manifestations of living a life on self-will. And when I started to look at these, these, these resentments, and when I started to look at this anger, when I started to look at um, the conflicts that were going on in my mind, man, it was painfully aware, I was painfully aware that I had to get out of the director's chair. And I wrote that inventory and I shared that inventory. And I had the most powerful, uh, most powerful experience in my life, other than my two children being born, when I did my original fifth step. And when I gave that man my life, because I was very aware of something very important, that these secrets that many of us have, that I would never get through that archway, or I would never get out into the sunlight of the spirit, if I think I can go out there with a secret in my back pocket, that I had to give this man everything. And there was a lot of fear in sharing my secrets. I've been carrying them for 25 years. I was going to go to my grave with them. You hear this all the time. But I had to trust this man, and I did. And I gave him my life. And I gave him my life. And at the end of that talk, it was a long talk, like we always talk about, you know, I took that hour, and I didn't come home and put the book on the shelf and take it down. I went to this place called Liberty State Park, overlooking Manhattan on the Jersey side, sat on the Hudson River, walked out on a pier, read the first five proposals, asked myself if all the stones properly in place. Looked to my right, I could see the Statue of Liberty was less, less than a quarter of a mile away. Looked across the Hudson River, I could see the, the World Trade Center. Look to my left, I could see Ellis Island, these symbols of freedom. And I sat there as a 32-year-old man with tears coming down my eyes, knowing for the first time I was going to be okay. 
knowing that God was doing for me what I could never do for myself. And I don't have the time to tell you how I hit the wall again and hit the wall again, because I don't think growing spiritually is a straight job. It's going straight up. I think we all grow. We hit walls. We grow. We hit walls. We have pain. We have both adversities. We have all that stuff that goes on. But when I became into when I came into six and seven, I started to look at some of the character defects, these behaviors, this need to run the show, this need to control, this need to you know these resentments, all these things that I found objectionable. Was I willing to stop doing them? Or willing to bring them to God and ask God to remove them? What am I willing to stop doing? What am I willing to start doing? Our character defects are nothing more than learned behaviors. I didn't. I wasn't born. You know, dishonest. I wasn't born selfish. I wasn't born that way. These are things that just over the amount of years just became me. My sponsor asked me, or let me put it this way, he gave me a consideration. I love this consideration. I'll throw it out to you guys right now because it, it really made me look at me. This is what he said to me Do I look at the people, the situation, and circumstances in my life? through the lens of a character defect or through the eyes of God. I'll say that again because it's quite powerful to me. Do I look at people in my life, the situations in my life, or the circumstances in my life through the lens of a character defect or through the eyes of God? You know, a lot of the times when I'm living, looking through the lens of a character defect, you know, my mind is very repetitive with negativity, useless, dualistic thinking, black and white, never a really a good thought, right? Always looking at you with jealousy, always looking at you with contempt, always dishonest, always selfish, you know, all those character defects. Rarely do I look at you and have compassion or love or forgiveness. If love and tolerance is our code, is it really our code? Well, those are just nice little, nice little line that we could throw out in the AA meeting so we sound good. Is love and tolerance really my code when it comes to my ex-wife or my old boss or an old friend or that new guy that walks into the meeting that disrupts the meeting? Is love and tolerance really my code? You know, as I went through six and seven and you know, I mean, we always, that's a continuous thing. It isn't, a, again, a linear thing. It's the, the two steps for the rest of my life. What am I willing to stop doing? And what am I willing to do? Seven-step prayer is not about, am I going to be happy or rich? It's really about, it's about being useful. Again, this idea of this intertwining of the steps that the third step tells me, man, I got to get out of the director's chair. And that if I really want to breathe free, I need to serve others. So how am I useful to others? Our dark past becomes the greatest asset we have. We get to share our life with another man or another woman. And hopefully they get free. And as I started to go through my amends and clean up the past, you know, and try to live with the disciplines that Wilson lays out in the 11th step, gives us a 24-hour period. Right? A daily reprieve contingent upon my spiritual maintenance. So I get it from awakening throughout the day when in doubt or agitated right up till when we retire at night. And I get to quiet the, no, the noise in my mind. Right? We used to call it stinking thinking. That's an old, for you young guys, that's an old time AA phrase. You never hear it. Well, no, you don't hear around me. Stinking thinking leads to drinking. God, that used to hear that all the time. I don't hear that at all. But through prayer, through meditation, and some actions, I've been able to look at the situations in my life, the circumstances, on most good days, through the eyes of God. You know, and when I can, and when I do, it allows me to be in union with myself, allows me to be in union with you, and allows me to be in union with God. Early on, a text tells me that when I straighten out spiritually, when I get right with God in those first three steps, I straighten out mentally through steps four, five, six, and seven. I get right with me. And then I get right with physically with the world around me in eight and nine. 
and 10 and 11 and 12 is just a, a repetition of all of that. We constantly remind ourselves. We constantly remind ourselves. We constantly remind ourselves. We constantly remind ourselves we're no longer running the show. We constantly remind ourselves to stop playing God. We constantly remind ourselves to get out of the director's chair. We constantly remind ourselves that I'm not that important. Constantly. Not when it's convenient. Constantly. And I had the kind of sponsor that you had to have a dictionary. Constantly. Now, that sounds like an easy word to define. But without, without variation, without deviation, and without change. You know, I've been sharing a lot lately uh, about my mom. And I don't know why I'm being moved all the time to talk about her. I don't know. It's, I guess it's the way it's supposed to be. My mom died last year of COVID, you know. And I could have looked at that situation through the lens of the character defects. Now, that sounds kind of cruel and, and kind of uh, non-caring, but the truth of the matter is, you know, I became the parent of my parent. I became the parent of my mother. She had full-blown dementia, didn't know who I was, didn't know who you were, didn't, didn't know anything. We had to put her away. And in that assisted living place, she got COVID. And I just got my knee replaced, and I was walking out of physical therapy when the hospice nurse said, she's going to go, you need to come see your mother. And I'm the only sibling that's around here in New Jersey. The rest of them are around the country. So I went to see my mother for the last time. And I had to take a COVID test. I had to put the outfit on back then, the PPE and all that stuff. And the hospice nurse stopped me in my bed and said, listen, she can't see you. She can't talk to you. But she'll know you're here the minute you start talking. I'm like, okay, I had no idea what I was in for. I haven't seen my mother close to two months now because of the dementia. She stopped eating. She thought, you know, that's what happens to people who have dementia. My sisters called me, FaceTime it so we could talk to her. They had no idea either. And I walk in that room, and my mother looks like a skeleton. Doesn't even look like the woman I knew. The woman who bailed me out of every possible jam I was ever in. The great enabler, my mom. And I'll never forget sitting down and holding her hand. And all of a sudden, I said, hi, mom. And her chest, it was like someone just blew in up oxygen. Her chest bounced. And she knew I was in the room. And then I had that moment. That moment when I got out of the director's chair. And thank God for what was about to go on in the next 45 minutes to an hour. I sat with my mom and I talked to her. And I told her how much I love her and all, you know, all the things we do. And what did I learn that? I learned that from you guys. The evidence is all around me of how people get through hard times in adversity and alcoholics anonymous. And I need to pay attention to that because my turn in the bucket will come sooner or later. All of us will go through the barrel one day. And I was so grateful that I listened to what you guys would talk about when it came to the death of someone you loved. And I sat with my mom and I had that moment. I am so grateful for that moment because after I left that, she died about an hour later. But I was so proud to be the one that God called to be there to talk to her. So this whole idea of thinking I know what I need to do, the things I have to manipulate, the control and be the director, all that crap that my mind manufactures to get my way, I was able to look at that situation through the eyes of God with love, with forgiveness and compassion for my mom. And I am so grateful I learned that in Alcoholics Anonymous. But like it says, when I constantly remind myself, when I constantly remind myself, constantly remind myself, putting the spiritual mirror up to myself on a daily basis, sometimes on an hourly basis, sometimes on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, here's what it tells me. When I constantly remind myself, we are then in much, lane, uh, much less danger of excitement, fear, anger, worry, self-pity foolish decisions. When I constantly remind myself, I become much more efficient. When I constantly remind myself, I don't tire so easily. We are not turning, uh, burning up energy foolishly as we did when we were trying to arrange life and suit ourselves. Every day is a day when I get to get out of the director's chair. Every day is a day when I make a decision. Every day is a day when God plays God 
I work for God, I help his kids, and God will take care of me. And my experience over 35 years of sobriety is just that, that God will always take care of me. He'll give me everything I need to be successful and everything I need to live. It works. It really does. That's all I got. Thank you, guys. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.